Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Amar Swali, and it is my immense pleasure to once again welcome you to the Africa Healthcare Network Fireside Chats. We are hosting chat number 126 this evening, and we will be having two speakers with us uh, tonight. We will save the Q&A for the end of the session. So I would like to introduce first uh, Ms. Benita Chowan. She is the live donation and preemptive transplant coordinator and the renal transplant nurse for listing and live donation at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust, and uh, she will be speaking to us about her role at the Trust. So, Benita, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Jan Mohammed, for giving me this opportunity and the entire renal team. It's it's really nice to um, be able to present here about my, my role as a nurse in UK. I'm from Nepal, born and brought up in Nepal, did my studies in India, and I'm in UK since last two years. I've had a bit, bit of experience of um, working in the renal department, in all areas of renal department, from chronic kidney disease to dialysis, um, AKI and transplantation. So today I'll just briefly talk about the specialist nurse, their role, and their importance of role in the uh, management of CKD as well as transplant. The overview of the presentation is as such, introduction, attributes and responsibilities, CKD stages and RRT, uh, in that the role of listing and preemptive um, transplant nurse, benefits and challenges, as well as at the last summary or conclusion. So this might be a bit of new um, topic for some of us, a specialist role. It's basically nursing, but with a bit of specialized um, experience in terms of experience, competency, and in terms of role. So with the advancement in clinical area, the nurses have come up with this role, which allows them to encompass uh, more of competency in terms of diagnosis, assessment, describing, as well as referral to different specialties. The Royal um, College of Nursing has um, introduced this role as or define this role as a vital contribution to the quality and development of nursing practice that is centered on the needs of individ individual. The main responsibility of specialist nurses are in terms of um, high core practice. Um, they are more, more independent in terms of their work and they're responsible and accountable for the um, type of promise, care promise. and time of care that they're provided to the patient. Uh, more of involvement in the planning, assessment, evaluating patient, um, educating, and um, finding all the effectiveness of treatment that is given to the patient. Solely involved in terms of physical examination and making diagnosis. Some practitioners, practitioners do make diagnosis and referral to the uh, specialities as well. Specialist nurses are more advanced in using the expert knowledge and clinical judgment. Uh, they are also involved in promoting, developing, um, an advancing nursing career in terms of clinical policy and strategic level. Right, to become specialist nurses, the, the main attributes required are uh, they have to have at least a degree level of nursing um, and also should possess specialist knowledge, skill, competency, and expertise. All this comes with experience as well as a lot of probably involvement in education or um, more in-depth um, degree masters or in terms of um, training as well. The, the key role components would be focused on the clinical competencies, education, involvement in research, auditing, liaising, and administration. Right, so with all these things, why it is more important in the renal area? We all know that chronic kidney disease is a global disease, and the, um, the rate with, with which Patients are advancing in chronic kidney disease are, um, are rapid. The workload is more. The study shows that there are about one in five men and one in four women who are affected with chronic kidney disease. Um, with advancement of this disease, the requirement of manpower is also more. And not only doctors, but nurses should come up in their role and in their competencies in management of this disease. This is the stages of chronic kidney disease where the red area are more focused um, in the involvement of um, practice of specialist nurses. When the patients are diagnosed with chronic kidney disease and their estimated glomerular filtration rate falls below 30, 25%, then the role of nurses become more prominent in terms of identifying the patients 
educating them, preparing them for um, the modalities of treatment. So chronic kidney disease has many modalities, modalities of uh, replacement therapies where we do know that they are heading towards dialysis, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, uh, transplantations or conservative management. Out of all these four, we say that transplantation is the foremost as it gives good quality of life and survival period for a patient. But for all these therapies to come forward, um, there is a lot of advancement in the clinical world. Now we are not just depending on crash landing of patients and keeping them alive. It's not a survival mode now, it's more of preparation mode. So how do we intervene in between is when patients are diagnosed with CKD and either they are rapidly or slowly progressing with a chronic kidney disease, we get involvement in terms of planning for the vascular access, following up with the surgeons, or if they are planning for PD, um, if that's a form of dialysis they want. And if, if they are young um, and if they have preserved renal function, and if they could go for transplantation, then we advocate transplantation for a patient. My role is mainly towards the yellow area where there is a transplantation and working up of patient for the cadaveric as well as live donation. Also in the transplantation, before it, we, it used to be more like stabilizing patient on dialysis and then thinking about the transplantation, but now it's more focused on having a preemptive transplantation. So the role that I possess right now at Royal Wolverhampton Trust is um, as a listing and live donation nurse to improve preemptive transplantation. What is preemptive transplantation or listing? It is listing of a patient for transplantation within six months of the anticipated need for re renal replacement therapy or transplantation of a patient with chronic kidney disease even before they are um, into dialysis. And why it is advocated now? It's because a lot of studies are there which says that um, it shows that um, there is decreased graft rejection rate with preemptive transplantation. There is improved survival rate of the recipient and the graft as well. Improved quality of life. Um, Long-term survival is better in, in diabetic patients with transplantation and other benefits such as fewer events of, um, um, of admissions, catheter-induced infections and decreased rate of hospitalization. Is any study to support my slides? Well, yes, there are a lot of studies that has been uh, that has proven preemptive transplantation is beneficial. There is one from H. H. Mirror which says that longer the wait on dialysis for a patient for transplantation, higher the risk of mortality risk. So that's why it's really important to focus on transplantation, especially preemptive. Uh, where the role of nurse has become really important in terms of following with the patient, identification, identification of patient, starting workup quite early so that by the time they are, at the time when they need dialysis, they are done with their workup, they're ready to receive a kidney and they're okay to go ahead with the surgery. Now, there are a lot of things that um, live donation nurse does. First thing is, as I said, the identification is very, very important. As a doctor, as a nurse, we could probably identify a recipient, but are we going more ahead to find out if they have a live donor option? Live donor option has a slightly higher chance of benefit in uh, benefit compared to the deceased donor. So are there any potential live donor? Have we spoken about it? Are, are they aware about donation? Are are they aware about the whole transplantation? Are they willing to come forward? If they do, where, do, whom do they speak to? What do they speak about? So all these things comes um, in the role. Then the other one is demonstration of clinical expertise in terms of, um, of experience as well as knowledge about renal disease, the expectations of the clinical symptoms when they are in chron when they have a chronic kidney disease but waiting for the transplantation. The other one is initiation of the workup. The, the transplantation workup has got a lot of investigation involved. The first one is, of course, to determine if recipient is well enough to receive transplant. If there is donor available, are they well enough to donate the, the organ? And is it safe for them to go ahead with the surgery? 
The other ones are participation in multidisciplinary team meetings, assessment and decision making process. We would be closely working with patient um, and all other, other multidisciplinary team in terms of working off for a patient for transplantation. There is a lot of participation included, a lot of liaison between different departments included um, for a transplantation workup as such. Uh, a lot of investigations, their results. Um, we need to follow up with the results. If there's any flagging up, we need to forward it to the particular department for further more workup if required. Uh, a lot of coordinating work and communication between the main transplant center as well as the referral center. So this is another slide which talks about the transplantation overall as in pre-transplant and the post-transplant care. The more focus is on the left side, as I've discussed, where there is a lot of liaising between the family, the, um, the medical team, the transplantation center, and uh, other healthcare professionals. No matter how much of very um, advanced word I use, the basic nursing always remains stronger where we do accompany journey of a patient from the diagnosis to different stages and to the treatment modality where transplantation has proven to be the best form of therapy or treatment. As a nurse or as a speci specialist nurse, we do stand as a main person in terms of everything that's involved in a care. We do advocate patient and family members. The first and foremost focus for us is to help them with all our abilities, knowledge, and um, competencies to help them make informed choices. Um, we do talk to our um, nephrologist colleagues about their plan and the further um, course of action in terms of clinical management. There is a lot of lies in between the dietitian, uh, pharmacist, social worker, and the psychologist to um, help patient to get the most benefit of the overall care. And that's it. If you do have any questions for me, please. Thank you, Benita. We'll be taking uh, questions at the uh, end of the session. Uh, it was a really wonderful insight into the challenging role uh, you know you play and most of the other transplant nurses play when it came uh, when it comes to the you know to the patient care and uh, you know pre-transplant donation. I would. Uh, like to carry on with the second part of this presentation. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, if you could share your screen. In the meantime, I would like to introduce our second speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Mubarak Ali Jan Mohammed. Uh, he's a consultant, nephrologist, and physician, and the deputy lead for the Joint Clinical Fellowship Program at the Wolverhampton and Walsall, and also a member of the at the international desk of the United Kingdom Kidney Association. He has previously had two wonderful talks with us uh, on the Fireside uh, Forum on the use of uh, novel oral anticoagulants in the dialysis patients, and also on the renal transplantation in the COVID era. He'll be speaking to us on, tonight on how to manage a patient with rising creatinine and lymphadenopathy. And with that, Dr. Mubarak, it is lovely to have you back again. Please take it away. Thank you. Uh, can you, you all see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. That was an amazing uh, talk, Benita. Thank you very much. So, um, I work as a consultant nephrologist and physician at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust. And I also work uh, part-time voluntarily at Muibili and in Tanzania, sometimes at Bugando as well. And I try and encourage young uh, doctors who are training to become nephrologists to enter the field and to join the wonderful world of nephrology. So this afternoon uh, or evening rather, we are going to have a different sort of presentation rather than discussing a specific topic we will discuss, we will have a case presentation. And the aim is for everybody to contribute and uh, discuss uh, with each other as we go along and learn from each other. So the case that I have brought in front of you is actually a real patient, a relative of mine who was unwell in Dar es Salaam, okay? So she was a 62, she is a 62 year old female with a background history of fairly well controlled type two diabetes mellitus and hypertension. Uh, but she noted over the past few months that she has been losing weight and has been generally unwell. So she went to her family doctor for a routine checkup. The blood tests that were done showed a creatinine of 160 micromole per liter, 
Her previous creatinine done about six months ago was 82. I know it is not very common for people to check their kidney functions, but uh, uh, six months ago, she had a very high blood sugar level and I had uh, requested her to do a full biochemical panel. So at that time, her kidney function was absolutely normal. But uh, taking forward from there, her glycemic control had slightly worsened. Her HbA1c was around 65 millimole per mole. And uh, towards, uh, just before she went to, the, uh, to her family doctor for the checkup, she was complaining of very vague abdominal symptoms. These are the medications that she's normally on, ramipril, metformin, atovastatin, and uh, multivitamins. The other investigations done by the doctor showed a normal liver function. Her full blood count was significant for lymphocytosis. She had a normal LDH level, low C3 and C4, and her urine dipstick was bland. So my question is, what other investigation would you do in a patient who presents like this? Volunteers, please. Amar, how many people are attending this session? Along with the panelists, about 91 now. So why is there absolute silence? We have a hand in the in the audience and I'm oh, going okay. to ask this person to talk. Oh, he's put his hand down. Okay. Uh, anybody uh, willing to contribute, please use the chat box. We'll be waiting for your messages. And the panelists are welcome to join in. Uh, uh, just a short summary. Uh, can we make a short summary of the case? So, so this is a 62-year-old female, Dr. Lloyd, who uh, yes. present, uh, with a background of type 2 diabetes and hypertension, who presented with weight loss, yes. vague, uh, vague abdominal symptoms, went for a routine checkup to her family physician, was found to have an abnormal renal function and a lymphocytosis with low complements. So, uh, so possibly a systemic illness wow. there uh, mm -hmm. is a possibility. So uh, I would investigate more in terms of a, uh, of a GN uh, uh, or uh, a vasculitis or lupus and things like that. So those investigations I would first do since there's hypocomplementemia. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's a very uh, reasonable line of thinking. But just, for, uh, just uh, to reiterate, her urine dipstick did not have any blood or pro protein. Uh, so she did not have a nephritic type picture, but you yeah. are, uh, but she definitely uh, is a, there's a, there's a strong possibility that there's a systemic illness going on. So uh, on a clinical the, examination, did it show any uh, lymphadenopathy there? Uh, on clinical examination, there was no visible lymphadenopathy, but I will come back to it. So because of the history of weight loss and lymphocytosis, our family physician was thinking along the lines of a malignant process, and he requested an ultrasound, abdomen, and some tumor markers. The tumor markers came back as negative. The ultrasound of her abdomen showed a very vague, hypodense area or, or region within the pancreas. And there was some para-aortic lymphadenopathy as well. Okay. So in order to qualify this further, we had a discussion. He called me, he said, look, this is what the ultrasonographer thinks. There, there, there may be a mass in the pancreas. So we decided to do a CT scan of the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis to, to rule out any primary malignant process going on. So the CT scan uh, showed this. So if you can see on your, can everybody see my cursor? Yes. Can you see my arrow? So these are three masses you can see in the pancreas. These are the kidneys. So the radiologist reported that both the kidneys were mildly enlarged and there were three masses in the pancreas. But yes, there was significant para-aortic uh, lymphadenopathy and in the chest CT, there was mediastinal lymphadenopathy as well. Okay, so this is the CT report of the abdomen. What do you think is going on now? So this is now a 62-year-old lady with a fairly recent renal dysfunction, weight loss, lymphocytosis, lymphadenopathy, um, and masses in the pancreas. It's, well, I, uh, at some stage, you might have to do a bone marrow aspiration and see what's going on in the bone marrow. What do you think is going on, Joseph? In the bone, the bone marrow, probably this, this might be... It could be uh, an acute lymphocytic leukemia, even chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or it could be just a lymphoma. Okay, that's reasonable. So a lymphoma or a CLL, these are two 
uh, uh, differential diagnoses which are very high on the list. Absolutely, I agree with you. What else? Uh, it should keep Cox as a differential diagnosis. Uh, you know, in a, in a tropical country, always tuberculosis can, can be a possible, although it definitely looks more like a lymphocytic process. Exactly. I agree. So uh, tuberculosis, yes, especially in a tropical country, I would expect uh, the patient to have more uh, uh, type B symptoms like fevers, night sweats, uh, but uh, weight loss is there, vague abdominal symptoms are there, the history seems to be subacute to chronic, so yes, tu a, tuberculo a tuberculous process uh, is a possibility as well. What other SLE. investigation? SLE, okay, lupus, SLE yes. You know, SLE is, I used to, I used to uh, tell some of my students that in a, in a renal exam, if you, if you don't know the diagnosis, you can just say SLE because it can very well fit into almost any presentation. So lupus, in this situation, again, lupus is very high on the list of differentials. I agree. But what investigation will help you in this case? I think a tissue diagnosis, go for a lymph node biopsy or a, or a kidney biopsy. Kidney biopsy, yes, would help. So she went to India for a CT-guided biopsy of her pancreatic mass. And these were this is what we saw. So on your screen, uh, can anybody tell me what they can see before I, I interpret the biopsy? So here, if we, if we look at this box here, can you see my arrow? So there are very well demarcated areas of infiltration with uh, inflammatory cells, particularly mm -hmm. lymphocytic infiltration. Okay, these are all lymphocytic infiltration, plasma cell infiltration. Here is a blood vessel, and this is uh, 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 inflammatory infiltrate around the blood vessel, which is a feature of phlebitis. Okay, this is a venule within the pancreas. In this, in this uh, slide here on the top right-hand corner, we can see collagen being formed. So there is already formation of fibrosis and there is a pattern. It's like it, it's being woven into a mat, this fibrosis here. Okay, and here there is another interstitial uh, uh, lymphocyte infiltrate. And on this slide here, forget the black arrows, but if you look at my, my cursor, I'm pointing toward these black dots. These are lymphocytes interspersed with eosinophils. So to summarize, there is a plasma lymphocytic infiltration with a particular pattern of fibrosis and uh, uh, phlebitis as well. Here is another biopsy, which shows a very uh, interesting pattern of uh, uh, inflammation and fibrosis. And this, this pattern of fibrosis is called storyform fibrosis. Storyform means it is like a, a woven into a mat. In Kiswahili, we say mkeka, woven into a mat, storyform fibrosis. So the biopsy result of her kidneys also came back, which showed tubular interstitial nephritis with dense infiltration of IgG4 positive mononuclear cells with interstitial fibrosis in a storyform pattern. What is the final diagnosis? Um, have we also uh, hello, can you hear me? And a myeloma uh, workup? Yes. So her serum-free light chains were uh, slightly raised in keeping with an abnormal kidney function, but the kappa to lambda ratio was not significantly raised as to make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Thank and you. you could not see any casts on her kidney biopsy as well. So people, diagnosis, otherwise we'll sit here till nine o'clock. Any Tanzanian time. <laughs> any other immunological markers checked? Her serum IgG4 levels were checked and they were significantly raised. Her, her ANCA antibody, lupus serology, uh, anti-GBM antibodies all came back as negative. Anybody wants to guess? I, I've already told you the diagnosis. IgG4 related IgG4 disease? Yes. IgG4 related disease. 
So that was the diagnosis. But Joseph, you mentioned about CLL. Are you satisfied that a patient with IgG4 related disease will have lymphocytosis? Okay, we'll come back to that later. So you mentioned the IgG4 related disease. So how will you manage that? Or do you want me to proceed and go forward with the presentation? So pin drop silence means. Pulse? Will sorry. Be pulse the pulse? Sorry. Pulse with steroids. Ah, pulse of steroids. Yes. So steroids. Yes. Whether I would pulse it or not is a different uh, uh, a question. It is an area of uh, debate. Some nephrologists would give methylprednisolone as a pulse, and some uh, uh, most nephrologists, however would just prescribe or oral steroids starting with uh, prednisolone 40 to 60 milligrams daily, okay? If the patient is not rapid, if the kidney function is not rapidly deteriorating, then you would just start with oral steroids. But if the patient's uh, kid creatinine is worsening on a, on a daily basis, then pulsing the patient with steroids would make sense. So, so yes, so this patient had IgG4 related disease. Now, IgG4 related disease, is a condition that is still being studied. What we do know is that it is a systemic autoimmune condition and it involves multiple organs, uh, the commonest one being the pancreas. And patients can present with autoimmune pancreatitis or autoimmune uh, sclerosing cholangitis if there is inflammation of the bile ducts within the pancreas. And the hallmark uh, histology uh, histological feature is infiltration of IgG4 positive plasma cells uh, and lymphocytes within these organs and formation of, uh, of masses within these organs as well. So this is a renal biopsy of a 45-year-old patient who had IgG4-related autoimmune pancreatitis. This does not show story form pattern as I had shown you earlier. What this does show, so this is the glomerulus in the kidney. It looks almost normal, okay? I can't see any crescents or any atrophy of the tuft. This here is the interstitium, and this is what we see. A lot of a lot of plasma cells infiltrates, inf infiltrated within the interstitium, some eosinophils and edema. So the, the inter interstitium, you can actually see that it's, it's spaced out, it's edematous. So this is an acute tubular interstitial uh, nephritis. Uh, the pathogenesis of IgG4-related disease is unclear, okay? There was a question whether or not the actual IgG4 molecule is uh, the, the pathogenic molecule, but the answer from multiple studies is that it is not pathogenic. So IgG4 itself does not cause the disease. Rather, it is as a result of an anti-inflammatory response to the autoimmune process that underlines this disease, Okay. There is formation of, of um, immune complexes and uh, 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 there is definite evidence of activation of the complement pathway. Clinical features vary depending on which organ systems have been affected, but generally patients present with sclerosing cholangitis. They may present with inflammation of the gallbladder, inflammation of the uh, uh, glands like the uh, parotid gland, the submandibular gland, the lacrimal glands in the eyes, and some patients present with retroperitoneal fibrosis as well. Up to 40% of patients will have lymphadenopathy. They may have axillary lymphadenopathy or lymphadenopathy in the mediastinum or around the aorta. Okay, When the kidneys are involved, you may have enlarged kidneys on, on uh, imaging, and you may have you may find hypoattenuated masses within the kidneys. Okay, those who have renal involvement, 80% will have radiologic abnormalities within the kidneys. So either a mass or an obstructive phenomenon. Okay, and uh, this paper, which was published in 2019, actually divided the phenotypes of IgG4-related disease into four groups. So we have group one in which uh, there is involvement of the of the uh, hepatobiliary and the pancreas axis. And then we have group two in which there is retroperitoneal fibrosis with avortitis. Group three is limited disease to the head and neck. And then group four, we have the Mikulic syndrome with systemic involvement. If this was an exam, I swear I would have asked the renal trainees, what is Mikulic syndrome? 
But since it is a presentation, I will give you the answer. So Mikulic syndrome is a constellation of uh, involvement of the lacrimal glands, the parotid gland, and the submandibular gland inflammation. That's that's termed as Mikulic syndrome. So looking at the uh, uh, utility of measuring serum IgG4 levels. So this study looked uh, uh, at the sensitivity and specificity of this test. And interestingly, it found that the sensitivity was almost 87% and specificity was 82% of, of measuring the serum IgG4 levels. So this test is very helpful in order for us to make a diagnosis of IgG4-related disease serologically. Now, coming back to the kidney, the commonest presentation, as you have already seen, is tubular interstitial nephritis. And I was just talking to our uh, hospital's histopathologist this morning, and he, he said that if you want to, if you look at the kidney biopsy and you see TIN, if you want to make a diagnosis of IgG4 related disease, you have to look at the ratio of IgG4 positive cells to IgG positive cells. So the specialized subclass IgG4 to IgG cells. And the ratio should be more than 40%. There is a small proportion of patients who may present with membranous nephropathy, which is negative to anti-phospholipid uh, antibodies. Okay. However, it is possible for membranous nephropathy to occur concurrently with TIN. The other renal presentation is obstructive uropathy due to retroperitoneal fibrosis. And the obstruction is at the ureteric level. So if you look at this slide, so this here tells you where the obstruction actually occurs. Can you appreciate these, uh, these zigzag lines? Yes? Yes. Good. So if, if you can see, it occurs around the lower part of the aorta and around the mid ureters. And if you look at this, uh, this imaging, you can see that this dye has accumulated in the proximal part of the ureter, and then you don't find any flow of dye. So there is an obstruction here at the at the ureteric level. This is an image of a patient with retroperitoneal fibrosis leading to uh, bilateral obstructive uropathy. This again is a kidney uh, biopsy. It shows these are obs obsolete glomeruli. This, this, these are sclerosed glomeruli. So this means there is some degree of chronic damage here. Okay, but you can appreciate the uh, the interstitial inflammation and the fibrotic pattern. The diagnostic criteria is histology. You should have at least more than 10 IgG4 positive plasma cells per high power field with uh, immune complex deposits in the tubular basement membrane. And these deposits should be staining for both IgG and C3. Okay. Imaging uh, uh, criteria should be fulfilled as well. Serologically, you should have raised uh, IgG4 levels. And obviously, since this is a systemic disease, the uh, definitive diagnosis is reached when you have or involvement of other organs, particularly the pancreas, which was the case with our patient. Now, there are two scenarios when it comes to commencing management or starting treatment. For patients who have stable disease, so let's say a patient comes to you with lymphadenopathy, mild inflammation of the uh, salivary and the lacrimal glands, but no other systemic symptoms and, and the kidney function is stable. In this patient, there is no indication to start steroids. Because remember, when you want to start any treatment, you have to weigh the benefit versus the risk. And steroids are quite toxic to, uh, to, to patients. You know, they, they, they involve a lot of complications. So there's no point in starting treatment if the disease is stable. But in a patient with active disease or with progressive disease who is symptomatic, like our patient that we discussed, we need to start treatment. And the hallmark of treatment or the first line of treatment is steroids. No specific protocol has been agreed to, okay? The dose of steroids, the starting dose of steroids varies between experts. It is accepted that most patients respond to 40 milligrams per day of prednisolone. And the response may take from a few days to a few weeks, okay? The aim of, of uh, managing these patients is to achieve remission. Remission means improvement of the kidney function, improvement in the radiological appearances, so shrinking of the masses on, on imaging, and reversal of the serologic findings, so a drop in the serum IgG4 level and improvement in the complement levels, okay? However, relapse is very common. So going back to my relative whom I'm presenting, 
she was started on steroids. She came back to uh, Dar es Salaam from India and she was on very high dose prednisolone. Obviously, she was a diabetic, so we had a lot of uh, challenges in, in regards to managing her glycemia. She was started on insulin, which uh, we subsequently reduced as her dose of steroids was tapered. She is currently taking, she was taking uh, 20 milligrams of prednisolone two weeks back. But when we repeated her CT scan, the mass in her pancreas has recurred. Her lymphocyte count is about 50,000 and her serum IgG4 levels have started going up again. There is a role of biologics as a second line treatment. The alternative treatment is rituximab. And I know rituximab is available in, in Tanzania and Kenya. I'm not sure about other African countries like Rwanda. It's definitely available in South Africa. So a grab of rituximab given uh, uh, over two weeks, a total of two doses, is uh, has shown to uh, cause disease, uh, immediate disease remission is about in about 97% of patients. But when these patients were followed up at 12 months, then only 40% remained in remission. So as you can see, the relapse rate is quite high. But rituximab is a good alternative as a steroid sparing agent, or some nephrologists may give it concurrently with steroids. But for those patients who do not respond to rituximab or in whom rituximab is uh, contraindicated, you have a second line uh, immunosuppressive therapy, which is either azathioprine or MMF. You will choose either of these two depending on your own expert opinion. So if, so if the patient in front of you is a pregnant female, you will definitely not give MMF, okay? If the patient has presented with very significant abdominal symptoms, then you would favor azathioprine over MMF. But the evidence of using azathioprine and, and MMF is very patchy, and um, the benefit is largely noted in, uh, in a small case series about, of, I think if I remember correctly, it was about nine patients. They only noted benefit in patients uh, with autoimmune pancreatitis uh, or uh, sclerosing cholangitis. So there is not much experience in using a AZA or MMF in patients with renal involvement. This was induction therapy. Regarding maintenance therapy, this is still an area of controversy. It's very debatable, okay? And maintenance therapy is reserved for patients who either have a recurrence or do not achieve remission. It is more reasonable to use uh, steroid sparing agents, so rituximab or MMF or AZA in patients uh, as a maintenance therapy. I have seen one case report on, of a patient who was put on tacrolimus, so there is not much evidence available. However, nephrologists in Asia opt to use low-dose glucocorticoids. So I remember I spoke to... Uh, my aunt's uh, nephrologist in India, and I suggested rituximab. And the guy literally flipped on the phone. He's like, no, no, no. Why do you want to give uh, your aunt very strong medication? We will continue with steroids. So I said, okay, that's fine. This is entirely your choice. I was just making a suggestion. But the other part of uh, management, apart from medical management, is interventional therapy. So patients who have obstructive uropathy due to retro retroperitoneal fibrosis or obstructive jaundice because of fibrosis within the pancreas can benefit from stenting. If there are large masses that cause uh, uh, pr uh, uh, pressure symptoms, then these can be debulked uh, through surgery. And in the case of aortitis or aortic aneurysms, you can refer to the vascular surgeons for endovascular repair, okay? Up to one third of patients who have been on rituximab will also will, will still experience relapse. So the prognosis is not very great. Most patients will relapse at some point anyways. And disease progression is, is very variable depending on, on the individual. Additional uh, studies for long-term prognosis are still needed. So this is an area that is still being studied. And there is a risk of malignancy. Some studies have shown uh, that patients uh, go on to develop lymphomas or other solid tumor malignancies. Uh, some and, and there are some studies which, which negate this risk totally. So this is another area of, of controversy. In the case of my aunt, if you remember correctly, she had lymphocytosis. And Joseph mentioned about the possibility of CLL. Well, in, in her case, we are still discussing the possibility that she may have CLL 
coexisting with IgG4 related disease. So these are two conditions co coexisting and, and uh, there is no particular link between, between them. So this brings me towards the end of my presentation. Asante Sana. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mubarak. And as always, it was very charismatic and interactive. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, please use the chat box uh, to post questions for both our presenters, and uh, we'll be taking turns between both of them uh, for answering. Uh, I'd like to kick things off, uh, uh, Dr. Mubarak. Maybe uh, my question would be when you had the repeat CT scan done, and uh, I, I, th I thought you mentioned that this was an enlarging pancreatic mass uh, despite being on a tapering dose of steroids. Would you classify this as a refractory disease? So I, what I missed telling you was after we started her on 60 milligrams of bread, she had a follow-up CT scan, uh, I think so eight weeks post initiation of steroids, and there was significant uh, reduction in the pancreatic masses. They were, they were almost gone actually, but we repeated another CT scan at four months. And uh, this is the CT scan that actually showed a recurrence of these masses as the steroids were being tapered. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Krabi on the, uh, is on the panel. I would like her to unmute herself and ask her questions live. Dr. Krabi, please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. My question is, is there any specific group that are likely to be affected by IgG4-related diseases? That's a very good question, Dr. Akrabi. So if you study the epidemiology of IgG4 disease, it commonly affects middle age to older males. Okay? This was a female. So there is the, the answer is there is no specific uh, group that would be uh, affected. It, the disease does, does show a prediction towards males, and particularly older males. But uh, incidence is, is very low, actually. So there is no particular gender group or age group that is more at risk of, of developing IgG4-related disease. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my second question is, uh, since this is a multisystemic, multi-organ-like uh, disease, and in this case, she didn't have any proteinuria, how do you assess remission and considering like adding another agent to steroid? So you assess remission by, number one, looking at the symptoms. Number two, looking at the radiological abnormalities. So you, if the CT scan has showed a pancreatic mass, then you look at the uh, progress of the mass after starting the patient on steroids. You, you study the serum IgG4 levels in the patient and the complement levels. So if they are reducing, that means your steroids are working. Thank you. You're welcome. In the meantime, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Bhima, could you please ask your question? I, uh, thanks, sir. Well, uh... Dr. Yamama, that was an excellent presentation. I really want to thank you for that. Thank you, Prof. I just want to tell you that uh, I've never come across this in children. I mean, I'm a big thing in the past. I kept quiet, you know what I mean? I didn't want to say anything. But I have never come across this in children. You know what I mean? Have there been any reports, to your knowledge, uh, in, 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 in childhood? Because I must say it evokes me. Sorry, Prof, your, uh, I couldn't hear the last part of your uh, okay. comment. Have, have, you, have you come across any reports of this in, in childhood, in children? In children, no, I haven't. I haven't come across. I mean, even in, in, the, in the UK, I, I have, so I'm working in the UK since the last seven years, if I remember correctly. It was seven years ago that Francis kicked me out of Tanzania and sent me to England. <laughs> um, wow. So... Okay. <laughs> okay. so, so I must say, this you totally made me because I've never come across it. In really? these in in these seven years, I've come across three patients. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's not a very common condition, and when this happened to my aunt who resides in Tanzania, it was an eye opener. So uh, the the reason I brought this particular case presentation on this platform is uh, to highlight the fact that this can happen anywhere, and when yeah. our when when my colleagues see patients with a similar presentation, then we should, I mean, this was a learning point for me as well. We should keep a broader perspective in in, lega, in regards to the uh, differential diagnosis. And I just hope she feels better soon. But thank you so much. I really thank you. Dr. Makabe is on the panel. Dr. Makabe, welcome. Good evening. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Amar. Uh, Dr. Mohammed. that was an uh, excellent presentation. And uh, actually, this is very, very rare. I haven't seen this case in, in my life, so. It's an eye opener for me. And um, I can tell you, your, your aunt was very, very lucky. 
that you are working in the UK, and probably I'm, I'm quite sure you took the biopsy to the UK um, for processing and you know reading that biopsy. Um, so I just wanted to know uh, how how was the renal function of the treatment? Um, that's number number one. And number two, um, uh, I was going through the, uh, the uh, you know this disease, and then I came across to the treatment of using re, um, vincristine as an alternative treatment for IgG4 related disease. So I just wanted to know uh, your experience uh, regarding vincristine as a treatment for that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ejina. So, uh, no, doctor, I, I, I didn't bring the biopsy to the UK. It's very, it's not very straightforward here. The system is very protective, but she had the biopsy done um, in India. And I think there was an option of the biopsy being repeated uh, at Aga Khan, but uh, the, nephro the her, her, her uh, oncologist and rheumatologist in India said there's no point in repeating a biopsy and making her go through the inter the interventional procedure. So her biopsy was only done once. Regarding vincristine, to be very honest, I haven't come across any evidence of its use in IgG4 related disease. But I wouldn't be surprised if you have read a case report because uh, the only evidence that that has that is around on uh, that is accepts that is accessible is very patchy and it's all only case, small case series and and uh, and isolated case reports. In addition to expert opinion. So I wouldn't entirely negate the use of vincristine, but in my uh, literature search, I haven't come across uh, vincristine as an option. I have come across abatacept as an option, but that was only uh, uh, based on one case report, as was uh, the use of tetrolimus. Thank you. Thank you very um, much. I think, uh, Amar, there's, in the chat box, there is a question about preemptive kidney transplantation. That's for Benita, I think. Benita, uh, uh, could, you, uh, could you answer that question if you read it? Yeah, of course. Um, so the preemptive transplantation, if you, well, in terms of UK, if you go for the disease donor listing, we can refer them if their function falls below 20%, depends on how rapid the uh, progression of CKD is. Um, but then they go in the general listing after EGFR is less than 15%. If you have a live donor option available, um, you could still be worked up after your EGFR falls below 15, but then unless it falls below 10, they would still keep you on the radar, keep everything ready. And then when um, every, like um, anesthetics, every, every, everything checkup is done, if the surgeons are happy, then you could go for the donation for the trans transplantation with a live donation. But the disease donor listing, of course, below 15%, you'll be active on the waiting list for preemptive. So uh, just to add what Benita has said, she normally uh, keeps a very close eye on all our patients and she stands with a stick in her hand uh, for all of us. The moment our patients EGFR falls below 20, we are expected to make a plan in regards to transplantation. So whether the patient is a fit for transplant, whether the patient can uh, is not fit for transplant, in which case we should specify why the patient is not fit. Does the patient have a significant cardiovascular uh, morbidity? Is the patient too old? Is the patient uh, unwilling to go for transplantation? So we have to specify that in our documentation. And she over she introduced this system and she oversees that in our hospital. Well, it's more of documentation and communication, isn't it? When you do audit, and see where we're lacking really in terms of transplantation or preemptive transplantation or benefit to a patient who could really benefit from transplantation where we're lacking. We could see the reasons behind it. And if there has not been any specific reasons, then there must be something that we could do to improve the service as such. So yeah, starting early identification and of course, getting behind consultants and different specialities is very important for getting transplantation done preemptively. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so we have Aaron Fataeli in the in the audience. Uh, Aaron, please unmute yourself and introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, uh, one question. Uh, I'm sorry, I dropped out. Uh, what's the, what was the bone marrow uh, report of that patient? Uh, Dr. Lloyd, the bone marrow uh, test wasn't done for her uh, when she was, so I referred her, so the initial uh, line of thought was along the lines of CLL, as Joseph had said, 
yes that's yes. why i was nodding very aggressively when he said cll yeah. but uh, uh, at that time her her renal function was preserved when she went to india after a few weeks her renal function became abnormal oh. and it was around 160 micromole per liter but uh, the nephrologist, uh, the, the oncologist at that time decided to go for a pancreas, a pancreas biopsy to, to make sure that because that was obvious, uh, there was a mass there and they could do a CT guided biopsy. The plan was if the pancreatic biopsy was inconclusive, then they would go for a bone marrow biopsy. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful case. Uh, really nice case and excellent discussion. So much of uh, knowledge. And I, I, I didn't know uh, the entire process and, and I've really not heard of IgG4 uh, disease. So thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, oh, okay. uh, uh, a lovely presentation. I just have one question. You see that we, uh, I think it's really good, uh, you know, to go for preemptive and it's really nice that you're really chasing these people with low GFR. Uh, one thing is uh, sometimes you see people when they don't go through the, uh, don't go through dialysis, you know, the graft loss uh, is, uh, they take this transplantation pretty lightly. And I see non-compliance occurring. So what is your comment on that? I think if you see overall, the take on chronic kidney disease is so lightly because they don't have symptoms unless the function goes below 10, if I say. When when patient comes with the presentation of vomiting, swollen legs, and we say, oh, your kidney function is really low, they wouldn't take it. They would say, oh, you're joking. My kidneys are working perfectly. My urine is fine. So the chronic kidney disease itself, the uptaking of the disease in themselves is really low. I think it's more of like awareness for patients that um, and, and acceptance from their area is very important for them. Well, the preemptive is not something that, um, that says that the patient on dialysis, um, you know, they should do, they should get transplant before a person, even before they go on dialysis. But there are a lot of studies which says that your cardiovascular function, everything are preserved. Your residual renal function is preserved when you get that transplantation done. So the graft function as well as the um, survival of recipient is much more higher in preemptive cases. It's more of, I think it's more of awareness to patient and education. And that could be done by consultants, uh, by surgeons, but most importantly by nurses who spend more time with patient and they listen to nurses more, I think. You know, I, com I completely agree with you. It's a very good point. What I mean is post-transplant, a lot of these people, because they don't go through the rigor of dialysis, they lose their graft because of non-compliance, post-transplant. You are very right. What is, We've your, experience? Got young... what is yeah. your experience in the UK? We've got a lot of young patients who have never had dialysis and they had a preemptive transplant and they were not serious about their medication uptake and now are working up for second transplant. Some people do learn from the mistake, but I think post-transplant follow-up is more important. I think post-transplant when they come for every clinic, if we could specify them about importance of of how they receive kidney from somebody to take care of it because they've, they've been given a second life really. But if some people do not appreciate enough, then when they end up on dialysis, then that's another take for them. But in, in UK, we've got a lot of patients who do end up on dialysis just because they could not appreciate the fact that they never received dialysis before transplantation. Dr. Lloyd, the, the commonest group that, that are uh, challenging for us are, are yeah. the teenagers, the, the young adults and teenage teenage patients? They are very yes. they are, they are, they are that's a challenging group as far as co uh, medication compliance is concerned. But yes, I think there is, I think the difference here is that, yes. uh, as Benita said, that the uh, the specialist nurses spend a lot of time with the patients in regards to uh, uh, educating them. They take them around the dialysis unit. Uh, they they know exactly what it entails to be on dialysis and when you are telling a, a young to middle-aged adult that you have to yes. now think about work because you have to come to hospital three times a day yes. then uh, you know it, it upsets their uh, you know they start taking it seriously at that point but you're absolutely correct they absolutely correct been on dialysis for a long time, and then they get the uh, transplant. They they tend to be more compliant, but unfortunately, there's a trade-off. There's a cardiovascular yes. risk there. Yes, 
yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. But it's really nice that uh, so much of trouble is taken to make sure that the you know the graft uh, like uh, the long term outcomes are good and uh, a close eye is kept on them post transplant, especially is that age group. Thank you very much. So th thank you, Doctor Lloyd. I've uh, I've unmuted uh, uh, Aaron Fatayli uh, uh, from Wimbley. I guess Aaron, could you introduce yourself and ask your question? Hello. Uh, my, name is Aaron. Um, my name is Aaron from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, student in nephrology nursing. So I would like to, to know, because most, most here in, in our country, we are doing transplant for the patient who are undergoing hemodialysis already. So if the, if the patient is opting for preemptive, and maybe he is or she is on stage three, Maybe sometimes you rare or other, other parameter like that and maybe high. So in, 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 in my experience, patient who is in dialysis is then going to the transplant. We have to do dialysis one day before the procedure. So I would like, I would like to, to have experience for these patients who are preemptive and they are going for dialysis for, for transplant. And maybe the JFR is maybe around 30. So... How about this patient for dialysis one day before that, before transplant? Right. So um, I've had the opportunity to work in the live donation team in India as well. So I come with experience from different parts of the world. Um, even when we have um, worked up a patient for preemptive transplantation, but when we do the blood test before surgery, that shows that the parameters are not really safe for them to go for transplantation without having a session or two sessions of dialysis. We do dialyze mm. them and then go for transplantation. So the overall thing is that have they done dialysis at all or no is not a thing, but how long they have been on dialysis mm. would be the main criteria for us to see how their graph would function later and how they would survive the whole transplantation. Mm. It all depends on the um, nephrologist and surgeon at the day when they decide, okay, tomorrow is the surgery and today's blood results are this. Are we safe to go ahead without dialysis for this patient? Yes, go ahead. If not, then at least one session and then go for transplantation. What do you say, Dr. Mubarak, about that? Yes, I agree. So, for, so Aaron, for uh, somebody with an EGFR of 30, I think yes. it's too early for transplantation. It's too early. There's no indication for transplantation. As Bidita said, workup for transplantation starts for EGFR less than 20. Uh, and obviously, you start seriously considering transplantation when the EGFR drops either less than 15 in some centers or less than 10. Now, uh, regarding dialysis, you want to look at the blood parameters and you want to look at the patient. If there is no acute indication for dialysis, then there's no point in dialyzing. But otherwise, if, if the blood parameters say so, then definitely you will give one session of dialysis before uh, sending the patient for transplantation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Aaron. And I would like to invite Professor Francis for, uh, for a question and comment. Uh, welcome, bro. Yes, thank you, Dr. Amma, and thank you, Mubarak, and thank you, my sister Benita. This is really excellent uh, talk and I uh, learned a lot. And I really want to say that we started uh, a renal nursing training in Tanzania, um, uh, I think uh, three years ago, and uh, we have some of the colleagues that are doing the training now. And so, and, and, and thank you for sharing your experience. So one thing that I really want to know is um, uh, one, of the, one, one of the challenges that we do get is the fact that uh, there's an ethical issue for the team that is caring for the patient to be involved in uh, uh, soliciting uh, uh, organs from the deceased donor. Are there restrictions for involvement of the nephrologist and the team that is taking care of the uh, of, 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 of uh, 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 potential recipients uh, on involvement in um, uh, soliciting uh, organs from from the from the from deceased donor? And the other thing is. Uh, how strict is it with the uh, foreign donation in, in foreign living donation in UK? Because I heard there's a case that a senator was jailed from Nigeria. So I would like to really know uh, what are they, how strict is it? And how, how feasible is it that people could come for uh, transplantation from other countries? Thank you. Right. 
the first one, how much of involvement in terms of the legal part, I would say. Um, we have got the Human Tissue Authority Department altogether very different to us. We do not get involved in any of the legal part at all. Although we talk to patient, keeping their documents ready in terms of their um, probably birth certificate, relationship, proof, and all these things. But we, are we from the medical um, point of view or clinical people who have been involved in taking care, we do not take any part in proving their relationship nor um, explaining their terms of relationship for the transplantation. There is a completely different department who are called HTA. They are a different body from NHS altogether who will have a different session with donor and recipient together and they are the one who will clear the case for transplantation. Um, the second question, donation from overseas. As far as I know, we can still have a donor from overseas for people who are living in UK and seeking care in UK with, with of course, legal, um, they are legally in UK, they have got NHS number, they are, um, they, they, they do receive care in UK in legal way. They can have a donor from overseas, but the donor should be first, first uh, relative, like it should be just mom, dad, or brother, sister or if spouse, then they, they, they should be really informed and educated about the donation. Then only we could send them over overseas donor pack once they get their preliminary investigation done in a country where they live and they get a clearance from a doctor saying that this person has a normal kidney function and the scan is this. And then we do send them visa to come here. And again, the whole relationship thing would be proven by the HDA, not not from the clinical personnel. Just adding on from that, uh, the, U the NHS does not encourage patients to solicit uh, organs from abroad. So we do not encourage our patients to go abroad for transplantation. If a patient decides to go abroad for transplantation as the, and, and, uh, and does not want to, uh, his name to go, his or her name to go on the waiting list, when the patient comes back, he, is, he or she will be stopped at the airport and a uh, detailed investigation will happen where the patient was transplanted, how was the transplant process, was any human being uh, uh, disadvantaged or made taken advantage of in regards to soliciting the organ, was any commercial transaction involved. So there is a very long process and there is a prison term to it as well. And I, I remember when I was working at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, we had one patient on dialysis who was very obese with a BMI of about 45, who was not fit for transplantation. And he, at that time, this law was not there, Francis. So he decided to go to Pakistan for uh, kidney transplantation. He came back from Pakistan. He was still dialysis dependent. Um, and I remember day one after arriving, he was on the dialysis unit and he dropped his blood pressure, spiked the temperature. And when I opened the dressing, the surgical wound, his graft was staring at me in my face. The wound was open and I could see the transplanted kidney. And he had major sepsis and he passed away in a, in a few days time. So uh, we don't encourage pe people to go abroad for transplantation. And there's a very strict process. Regarding foreign patients coming to the UK for transplantation, I have not come across that because here uh, private healthcare is so expensive and I don't think private insurance covers transplantation. So uh, unless the, uh, the patient is registered with the NHS, it's very, it's, it's very difficult for a foreigner to get transplantation. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. Uh, thank you, Professor Francis, for your uh, contribution. Uh, Dr. Narendra, one last question for you, from you, please. Uh, okay, I would like to thank uh, the doctor for sharing his experience with us. But uh, this, particularly this rare case of uh, uh, are you for rented in a proper shop? Now, but uh, we, we, there is a normal kind of syndrome, the tuberous transition nephritis and uveitis. I just wonder how it is related to this. Is, is it part of that syndrome? Joseph, do you mean TINU? T I N U? Tubular interstitial yes, nephritis yeah, and uveitis. Yes. I have only read about it while preparing for my nephrology specialist exam. I have never seen it. So tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis it can be as part of the lupus 
syndrome and it is treated as you would treat a patient with lupus. Uh, if the patient has got other serological features suggestive of lupus. Um, in regards to IgG4 related disease, I have not seen uh, this occur together, but theoretically it still can occur. You can have uveitis as part of IgG4 related disease, but more commoner than uveitis, the eye involvement, uh, there is inflammatory uh, masses which occur behind the eye retroorbitally. So you have proptosis. The eye actually comes out of the socket, proptosis. And that is actually reversible when commencing uh, steroids or immunosuppressive therapy. So again, the, it boils down to steroids and immunosuppressive therapy, even if they occur together. Amar, you are muted. Uh, Amar, you are muted. Oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me that. Uh, just a small announcement that uh, we will have a recording of this presentation available on YouTube by Monday. And also for uh, attendees claiming CPD points for Tanzania and Kenya, the link is available in the chat box. Uh, so please use that link to claim your CPD points for tonight. I would like to invite Dr. Lloyd to, for a vote of thanks and uh, to close out the presentation and also personally from me to Dr. Mubarak uh, and Ms. Benita again uh, for the wonderful engaging presentation that we have had tonight. On behalf of Dr. Lloyd and Africa Healthcare Network, I would like to thank all of you for attending uh, this presentation tonight, thanking both presenters for taking time out to be with us and uh, hoping that they would uh, volunteer to come and join us once again for another wonderful engaging presentation as they have tonight. And uh, thank you for taking this time out. It was lovely seeing you tonight. Thank you everyone for attending.